Today's episode of Necronomapod is brought to you by Beardology. There are a lot of imitators out there, but there's only one place I buy my beard oil. Beardology beard oil nourishes your skin and won't leave you with that greasy feel. With over 17 cents available in their extensive product line, I trust my beard to Beardology. You can find Beardology at beardology.co. Use code NECRO15 to receive 15% off your purchase. Beardology, discover the best way to avoid the shave. Our hometown of Cleveland, Ohio boasts many dubious distinctions. From a five decade long championship drought to our polluted river catching fire not once, but twice, to today's topic, the Torso Murderer. The Torso Murderer was responsible for at least 13 deaths, most likely more in the 1930s. A mainstream investigation was opened up after dismembered bodies were found all throughout the downtown area. But even with all the body parts recovered, most victims were never identified, and the killer was never to be found. Way to go, Cleveland. I'm Mike. I'm Ian. And I'm Dave. If you thought crunches were murder on your torso, stick around. We've got a mad butcher we'd like to introduce you to. This is Necronomapod. It began to unfold in September of 1934. The only problem was nobody knew that anything was unfolding at that time. They just thought it was a very strange, rather horrible murder. A man by the name of Frank Lagasse, who lived in Beulah Park, which is east of Bracknell in Euclid, was walking along the shores of Lake Erie looking for driftwood to burn. This was, after all, the Depression. And he saw something which he later described to friends as looking like a tree trunk with the bark stripped off of it. When he got closer, he realized it was the lower half of a woman's torso amputated at the knees. All right, so the week of uh, the most fucked up serial killers we could find continues. Yeah. This one was uh, a Dave pick. This was your pick this week. It's a great story. And entry number two in our highly recommended Hometown Heroes series that we rolled out this week. Yeah. <laughs> this will be an ongoing theme probably throughout our show, but this week just happened to be extra special with uh, two in the same week. It wasn't planned. Yeah. It just, uh, just kind of happened that way. It just kind of happened. Just the way the cookie crumbles. As they say. As they say. <laughs> so we're the uh, Cleveland Torso Murderer. Yeah, let's, let's, let's jump into it. Um, the Cleveland Torso Murderer, also known as the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. Which is, I'm going to nominate for maybe one of the best nicknames. The Mad um, Butcher? The Mad Butcher of yeah. Kingsbury Run. That's got to be up there with like the Screen Door Intruder as like the best nicknames we've had on this show. It's but, pretty cool. But this one's actually like a legit good... What are you trying to say? Screen Door Intruder is not <laughs> legit good? I'm terrified of that guy. It reminds me of something from like Game of Thrones or something. The, the Mad, Mad Butcher. butcher. You know? Oh, yeah. Isn't that the show where they ran out of ideas because a guy stopped writing books like 10 years ago, even though he's getting paid how many millions of dollars and yeah. he decided he's not going to work anymore? So now the TV writers have to write the rest of that show and it's not as good. You're probably you. You have to be one of the few individuals in the in the country that don't like Game of Thrones. But I don't say I didn't like it. I just <laughs> have never seen it. it. Oh, okay. doesn't know okay. it's like not it. really my genre, yeah. but I know I'm not knocking it, but I, that's what I heard that this season's not really that good because it's probably TV writers that are doing it and not the author. Oh, well, it's they didn't been have that like, way for a couple of years at this point. Oh, has it? He but just like, gave them the plot points. I heard like the character development's been lacking and like it was all the stuff that he put in all the extra time and work for. They kind of just TV rushed out. No, I think some people are just salty because characters aren't panning out the way that they want them to. Mm. Write your own fucking series if you don't like it. They're hot takes sure. from Dave <laughs> on Game of Thrones. I mean, I just think this guy should finish his books, though. No, I don't mean you. I mean these fans who are complaining about the final season. If you don't like it, then write your own series. So don't they, watch it. This mother is season effort. what? <laughs> Did you just censor yourself? <laughs> what season are they on? Like seven, eight, eight. eight. His book stopped at what season? And it's a terrible tangent we're on, but it's uh, the fifth book. They, and that he's got writing through five seasons on the show. He's writing the sixth book right now. Okay, and so and there's one more to come out. After I guess my that. question is: When his books come out, are they going to match what you saw on TV? Not no, necessarily. No, he just gave them plot points to finish it based on what he planned to write right and he'll write more in depth 
yeah. books based on that. Yeah. So there might be different conclusions. Yeah, probably. If he does it at all. Yeah. And then I mean, he's a very large, what, 71-year-old gentleman? <laughs> yeah. I, you know, He's not going to live long Is enough. he English? Is Where is he from? Yeah, I believe he's British. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, there's our... Game of our, Thrones chat for the week. Our commentary on Game of Thrones. The finale is going to be tonight, so... Nice. Yeah. Right. This will come out on Sunday. Yeah. Like the series finale. Like, that's it. Absolutely. All right. I'm hyped. Look at that. We had the whole conversation, and we didn't give away any spoilers. I'm going to do my routine that I've been doing. I'm going to get a blizzard from Dairy Queen with Angie. <laughs> I'm just going to sit there and be super fat and eat my blizzard and That's what <laughs> watch Game of Thrones. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> Sounds great. All right. Now the question that literally probably everyone listening is thinking, mm-hmm. what kind of blizzard? The ch- strawberry cheesecake. Ooh, they didn't put high. any chunks of cheesecake in it last time, and I was not thrilled. You we were flipping fucking tables. <laughs> I was super pissed. Angry fat guy came out of you, and you were like, where's my goddamn cheesecake? It was just full of str- strawberry ice cream. That's basically what it was. <laughs> this or cher- did you say cherry or strawberry? Strawberry. Did you write a strongly worded review on Yelp? <laughs> I did not. What's your go-to blizzard? Heath Bar. That's good. Or Butterfinger. Mm. I used to be an M&M guy, and then I switched to Butterfinger, yeah. and that's that's golden. Angie gets the cotton candy. I feel like that'd be too sweet. It's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're way off the fucking rails. Yeah. Yeah. Game of Thrones, Dairy minutes. Queen, and we're just getting started. Yep. So the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. Yeah, so he's um, it's still an unsolved murder case responsible for 13 victims possibly more that happened in cleveland ohio in the 1930s um while only officially being credited for 13 murders the recent evidence suggests that there may in fact be close to 20 i think the lead detective thought maybe even as high as 50 so wow. it was a lot and back then like with like this guy and we're you know we'll get into it and stuff but like uh jack the ripper and stuff like it's super hard to catch anybody like that back oh, yeah then. not much in the way of forensics and right they preyed on the you know the underbelly of society yeah. and really no one cared about these victims as we'll see here so the murders all took place between 1935 and 1938 during the time elliot ness famed for his leadership of the untouchables group that put away Al Capone was the public safety director for the city of Cleveland. Ness was in charge of the Cleveland Police Department, so he wasn't directly responsible for the investigation, but his involvement and reputation added an additional level of celebrity to the murders. Shining a spotlight on Cleveland. Yep. Always the best. Most of the victims appeared to be lower class individuals, like you said, the underbelly of of society. Which is a theme with like most serial killers we've talked about. Yeah, even up until today, it's... Especially back then during the Depression. I mean, there was a ton of people, drifters and transients yeah. and all, all kinds of things like that. So, yeah, those people were considered to be easy prey in the Depression era of Cleveland. So, um, And only two of the victims were ever actually identified. The Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run gets its name from the area of Cleveland where many of the victims were found. It's a stretch of land that runs from East 79th Street in Cleveland down to the industrial areas of the flats near the Cuyahoga River. One of you guys want to explain what the flats are? It's an old uh, industrial area down, you know, right uh, just west of downtown that the Cuyahoga River runs through. For a while, it was uh, built back up with lots of bars and, you know, so people partied down there. It was a big like that. bar scene. And then it kind of went away. and I were born. <laughs> in the late 90s. and then, But it's uh, experiencing a, a rebirth these days. That's yeah, making a comeback. Yeah. There's a ton of new apartment housing and a lot, a lot of people live down there. If you ever come visit Cleveland, you can probably find yourself an Airbnb in the flats. Absolutely. Yeah. There's probably still bones buried down here. <laughs> <laughs> these victims so i'm sure they didn't find it well if you ever come to cleveland hit us up and we'll do like a live show looking for some bones there you go ghost tour bring some pickaxes and shovels and we'll see what we can <laughs> we'll find. go visit the uh, cleveland police museum we're going to talk about here in a minute absolutely yeah the trains in rapid transit still run through this area on their way downtown. During the 1930s, the area was lined with cheap housing and taverns and was notorious as a hangout for prostitutes, pimps, drug dealers, and like you were saying earlier, again, the old underbelly of society. Yeah. Red light district. The fun place to hang out. <laughs> <laughs> Additionally, several shanty towns developed throughout this area at this time and presented the perfect setting for the mad butcher to select and murder victims. There's pictures of that you can find the old shanty towns down there and it's uh it's not great yeah i'm sure yeah, yeah. What, so what's the what is a shanty town was just like ad hoc dwellings that people just, build out okay. of that's what i scrap saw wood and 
you know exactly what you think it would look like yeah not the not the greatest place to live i'm sure police and stuff didn't even go in those areas oh, or yeah. anything kind of like a Why world of its they, own yeah. you know Just makes it prime real estate to go in there and get yourself some victims yeah no exactly. one's gonna know they're missing and no one's gonna really care probably so the first uh get into the first victim here september 1934 a young man found the lower half of a woman's torso with her thighs still attached but amputated at the knees um, and she washed up on the shores of Lake Erie just east of downtown. Cuyahoga County Coroner A.J. Pierce noted some of the chemical preservative on the skin, which had turned it red, tough, and leathery. When I was looking into like all these things, I thought that was like really creepy. So what does that mean? He had the body preserved somewhere for a while to There's, keep it around? I don't know, or something that he put on it that... Hmm. Because I saw it when I was looking into it, it happened with, mul- we'll see multiple yeah. people have this weird red leathery thing. They never were able to figure out what the chemical was, though, right? That's no. that I saw. Mm-mm. Was that just because of a lack of technology back then to figure that out? It's a good question. I mean, maybe. I don't know. Or it, maybe it was because they had, bought, it had been in the lake for so long. Maybe it had just... Could be true. Yeah, I don't know. Um, the search only turned up a few other body parts. The body was of a woman in her mid-30s. Uh, her head was never found, and the woman was, on, was never identified. She was only referred to as the Lady of the Lake. It wasn't until until two years later that this find was included in the official killing total and thus she became known as victim number zero so it was like a year before the killing started and and later on, they went back and like, oh, this lady probably fits the same mo. Right. And they added her on as a as an afterthought. Right. Okay. Hence, like zero, we can't change all the number victim one. numbers. We, Fuck, we can't change all these. Just make her zero. <laughs> if we find someone else, they'll be negative one. <laughs> It would still be another year before the case officially officially began. So then we'll get into September 1935. Two teenage boys discovered the decapitated, emasculated corpse of a white male at the base of Jackass Hill. What'd you call me? <laughs> where East 49th Street dead ends into Kingsbury Run. So the body was naked except for a pair of socks um, and was cleaned and drained of blood. There were rope burns around both wrists. Coroner Pierce determined the cause of death had been decapitation. So that right there, it's not like he was decapitated after he was dead. So when the cause of death is decapitation, right. you're, you're fully awake for that part of it, right? That's pretty brutal. Yeah. How did they determine the cause of death? Like, did, were they finding the heads for, did they find the heads for this guy? Or did you just say they found the body decapitated and emasculated? So like, how were they determining that the cause of death was decapitation as opposed to it just being cut off after? Is it maybe like where the blood, they found like the remnants of the blood around his neck so it showed that that's where all the blood was coming from so that's probably where the wound came from i don't know yeah. that's maybe that's how it like thought. how it clotted yeah. up there or something because i mean it's 30 so they don't have like we talked about the high technology they're just probably basing it mm-hmm. off what they see yeah and if they're not even finding the head i mean i don't even know how that would make a difference other than if you're looking for where like the blood is or where like the, the first wound might have been I don't right know. well actually this is the head the the picture we posted on instagram this is the guy this is him yeah so they did find the head yeah but did they find it at the same time? I believe they did. They yeah. found it together. They did not they? find his pee pee. This was believe. our. They did not find that. <laughs> <laughs> this was the teaser pick we put out. On Correct. Friday. Edward Andrusy. You know, fun fact about getting your head cut off while you're still alive is that your brain still registers for a couple. For like about 20 to 30 seconds. That's what they say. Yeah. In France, they would do those uh, experiments at the guillotine and, and try yeah. to, to see like what kind of, I guess, consciousness the head was in after it hit the basket. Yeah, there's one account from the 1700s where someone ran up there and picked up someone's head that had just been cut off and just smacked him in the face and the person's face like registered like they were pissed. Like, the fuck, do we, why'd you just smack me? Can you imagine? <laughs> oh, holy shit. <laughs> Why would you just go run enough and grab a severed head and smack it in the face? I don't know if this is just me because it was like from my childhood. Whenever I think of like decapitation or severed heads, I think of I think it's the um uh the last scene or like the final the end of the movie of what is it Conan the Barbarian where he cuts where it's, it's Schwar- the Schwarzenegger yeah. one where he cuts the was it the king's head off and then he holds it off and then drops it and it rolls all the way down the steps. Gosh, I haven't seen that. You guys remember in a long that? time? Mm-hmm. I really don't remember. Have you the seen that? One? I don't know. Huh? Oh, I love of that Conan the Barbarian and the Destroyer. I love both of them. People don't like the Destroyer. They shit on it. But uh, I think it's near the end of the movie. He cuts okay. off. I think he's the king. You know, he's the bad guy. Okay. 
cuts his head off and like holds it up to all the people and then he just drops it and you just hear the head thump all the <laughs> right. way down these steps and it's so realistic and creepy and then Conan takes his throne. So that dude felt all that going well, that's all what the I was way thinking. down. Like, yeah. Man, I wonder if like, he's breaking his face now. <laughs> Fuck that. Did Conan rule well after that? Well, you should watch Conan the uh, Destroyer. <laughs> I really don't remember those movies at all. It's been a while now since I've seen them. They're on TV every now and then and I'll put them on. But hmm. Didn't they remake that? Did they remake they that? They remade at least ago? one. I can't remember with who, but I didn't want to watch it. Yeah. I don't want to stick with Arnold. And I think that whole movie, he's got like seven lines. The whole first because he, I mean, right. he was still fresh, like he didn't oh, speak yeah. English very well. He had like seven lines that whole movie. And then is it Conan the Destroyer is the second one with uh, Wilt Chamberlain. In it as Bambata. I don't know really how to say it like that. Bambata. Real good, man. Those are like some of my favorite movies as a kid. Fuck Ferris Bueller. <laughs> An unnatural hatred for some things that are. <laughs> I, I, I'm i not lukewarm on anything. I either love things or hate them. That is very true. I have no moderate feelings on anything. Um, the fingerprints identified this victim as Edward Andresy, a 28-year-old white male. Police discovered a second body nearby that was also decapitated and emasculated. So I'm, that means that his dick was cut off, correct? Yeah, two for one special here. Yeah. It, Neither dick was recovered in this situation, correct? That's what uh, we established. That's my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. It appeared to be covered with the same chemical preservative as the Lady of the Lake. This body had apparently been dead for at least a couple weeks. The 40-year-old white male, this victim was a 40-year-old white male, was never identified. Yeah, I'm curious about the preservatives still. Yeah. So if he'd been dead for a couple weeks, he must have been stored somewhere, right? Because even you could, I mean, that definitely, I mean, that's that's like, I mean, that would 100% link these. You know what I mean? Like, if there was wasn't that you could maybe say like this this person could have like gone on yeah and never been linked together you know but why, they, why do you think he'd been stored somewhere like if the chemical was on him maybe he was thrown in the water and that's why he didn't decompose as quick but these guys weren't in the water though. oh i thought they said they washed up ashore oh no i'm sorry they were found at the base of jackass hill yeah right okay never mind i'm gonna say two weeks or they thought he had been dead for two weeks yeah so i mean he, he was somewhere yeah, he was somewhere he wasn't decomposing out in the yeah. in the field but i'm saying maybe he wasn't decomposing because of the chemicals maybe oh, yeah, he was exactly. just thrown right in the field maybe, well, I mean why, how do we know he wasn't just ditched in the field maybe he put unless this, this was a big open field yeah. uh, so like Kingsbury runs like kind of a, a gully where an old uh, where the river runs along there yeah I don't know that area at yeah. all it's just where all the trains run through these days maybe he just made wanted to make sure people actually saw the bodies yeah. well I think and as we're going to get to later in the story that's kind of exactly what he was doing right, right. Like he was taunting did they embalm he or people she, back or then uh, I don't know I mean like are we talking about formaldehyde when, when they reference preservative because it's just not real clear yeah I have no idea I'm sure they did something yeah they had to right yeah. I just don't know the history of embalming and when that came about Homework. maybe for a future episode we'll interview uh, a mortician, mortician. <laughs> that'd be interesting yeah, that that'd be, be really interesting I have a connection too there you go do you? Yeah. All right. Okay. So his name is Paul Bear. <laughs> is it <laughs> motherfucker? No, I really do. I really do. I really do. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> I really do. Anyways. Oh boy. <laughs> January 1936, um, a woman discovered about half of the body of a female that was neatly wrapped in newspaper and packed in two half bushel baskets. Like, that's nuts. The baskets were left alongside the Hart Manufacturing Building uh, east of downtown. Everything except the head was recovered about 10 days later in a vacant lot on the nearby, or on the nearby Orange Avenue. Just like uh, Edward Andersey, the case, the cause of death had been decapitation. Um, but for some reason, the killer had waited for rigor mortis to set in before dismembering the rest of the body. Do you think they knew that because it looked like there was more rigid, difficult cut marks or... You know, maybe, like it, maybe. there was more damage as opposed to the clean decapitations and clean butchery work that he had done. That previous. makes sense that you'd be able to tell that, I think. I would imagine so. I mean, how else would you know that, yeah. that Rigor Mortis that makes said sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I unless, assume. unless it, I mean, when Rigor Mortis, are things more likely to break and snap and come apart, like crumble? Because they're not as pliable. Because, as, right. Yeah. 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 Uh, probably. Yeah. yeah, I would assume that would be probably at least part of it. Mm. Because, I, yeah, you could probably tell from the skin, too. Like, the skin would Yeah, it's true. Get the weird. damage on the skin, yeah. 
Fingerprints again allowed them to identify this victim as Florence Palillo, um, a waitress, barmaid, and a prostitute. So I think it's this this guy with women. He cut them into smaller pieces like this versus the men where he you know just took their head and maybe their penis. Why do you think that is? I don't know. Yeah. So that's a trend throughout the women are cut, cut be, up yeah, more yeah. into smaller pieces. Hmm. What's that about? That's interesting. Any of the women found with that chemical on them, or was it just those just first few first, days? Um, I don't know. Guess we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Little teaser. <laughs> I wonder why you waited till the rigor mortis for this one. Yeah, I don't. Maybe I mean I don't know. Maybe he got distracted in his work and yeah. he couldn't get back yeah. to it until that set in. Yeah, that's the one. Did they um? Did they think he was doing this like right on the scene, pretty much, or was he doing this elsewhere and then bringing them? Some of them. There were some. I think that he did. They they said he did on the scene because they could tell by the amount of blood. Exactly. Okay. The other ones, it didn't sound like there was a lot of blood, or they didn't know like cause the ones they found in water. Obviously, those weren't on scene. Right. He or the guy that's been dead for two weeks. Uh, yeah, right. I don't think was on scene. And I guess without having a finding anyone you don't have like an actual crime scene like location right, yeah. where he did his work so they they probably don't know but then again if you're picking off these you know transients down in this area wh- where else would you take them so it's a little confusing what do you mean like when could you, couldn't you take them back to your place like, like how your- like how though well, I, I don't know. Like I think it makes it very difficult to know without knowing who it yeah. is. You know, maybe they had a large vehicle. Maybe they were a postman and they threw him in the back of their mail truck. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Or maybe they did. They maybe like maybe they did do it on scene. You know, it's there's there's a lot more questions after this one than there are answers in most like most episodes. We get answers. We just did um, uh, Birdella, you know, earlier la- or last week for the bonus. And he had his notes and he told everything like right. we got all the answers. This yeah. one, I mean, by the end of it, you're going to be scratching your head going, OK, a lot of body parts. What happened? <laughs> I think you're right. We don't know. Yeah. Well, plus it's 80 years ago. Yeah, this and one gives you like real serial killer ago, blue balls ago. here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, June 1936, uh, early one morning in Kingsbury Run, two young boys discovered the head of a white male that was wrapped in a pair of trousers close to the East 55th Street Bridge. Police found the body of the 20-something-year-old man the next day dumped in front of the Nickel Plate Railroad Police Building. So his body was just jumped in front of the, uh, or dropped in front of the police station. Yeah, that's what it yeah, more or less. So it's pretty the, clearly the taunting. Yeah, yeah. Um, this guy, his his body was clean and drained of blood and the corpse was completely intact except for the head. Pierce again determined that the death had been caused by decapitation. Mm. In spite of a fresh set of fingerprints and the presence of six distinctive tattoos on various parts of the body, police were never able to identify the victim. They have the tattoos down at the museum, right? I believe they do, yeah. yeah. That's wild with all that and they, they can't figure out who it is. Mm-hmm. Might be just some guy passing through town, you know, ride, they, you know, they would ride the trains and whatnot. Right. And, yeah, you know, some random guy. Yeah. Easy pickings. Yeah. A plaster reproduction of the man's head along with a diagram of the kind and location of the tattoos were made to display at the Great Lakes Exposition of 1936 more than 100,000 people saw the death mask and tattoo chart um, he was known as the tattoo man who was never identified the original death mask along with three others from the case are on display at the Cleveland Police Museum we gotta go there we gotta check that out yeah, yeah. and we'll, we'll post a picture of that too but yeah, um, the, the, the death masks are, are they're pretty creepy yeah they're real yeah they're cool fucked up but yeah i want to go to that museum so then that gets us to july 1936 a teenage girl came across the decapitated remains of a 40 of a 40 year old white male while walking through the woods near the west side of cleveland that's a little bit further from his typical spot he's going more west now it's um, like ridge road just north of uh, memphis over there yeah i mean that's that's a quite a few miles away from his, his other spots the this victim had been dead about two months and his head as well as a pile of bloody clothing was found nearby judging by the enormous quantity of blood that seeped into the ground this man, man had apparently been killed where his body was found so this is the one where they he just uh killed him and decapitated him and left him there yeah Right. So after two months, I don't know what shape the remains were in, but probably not great, right? I would you imagine s- not. Yeah. In July, too, with that heat. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine the stench? Yeah, that's gross. So then two months later, um, in September 1936, a transient tripped over the upper half of a man's torso while trying to hop a train at the East 37th Street in Kingsbury Run. Police searched a nearby pool, which was nothing more than a big open sewer. That's super gross. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> nearby pool. Yeah. <laughs> and found the lower half of the torso and parts of both legs. I grew up in Cleveland going to those city pools, and uh, some of them were nothing more than an open <laughs> sewer, let me tell you. Right. The police sent in a diver to to make the recovery of the remains. The number of people that were that were looking, that were standing there looking at everything, turned out to estimate, it was estimated to be over 600 people, and could very well assume that the, the killer might have been one of the people just watching this all, all go down. I'm sure he was, right? Yeah. Don't a lot of killers like to do that, come back and blend in? At the crime scene, watch the police work. Yeah, is that a thing? Is that what they? A lot of them do? like to talk to the police. And we haven't like, had anybody like that though, have we? we Kemper, Ed Kemper, yeah. Oh, that's true. He would always talk to the police about what was going on. Well, they were just they were at his local watering hole. What was that place <laughs> called? Oh fuck, shit! It's still there too. The yeah. Oh, the jury room. The jury room. Yeah, that's right. Old bumble butt. Yeah, but a lot of those guys do that. They'll try and mm-hmm. try and talk and see what's going on. And who was it? Was it Ed Gein that made the jokes about the missing people? Like, oh yeah, they're locked up in my house. Yes. Ha ha yeah. ha. No, but seriously, <laughs> they said that was one of his favorite yeah. jokes. No, to really, tell. she's at my house. <laughs> no, but seriously, she's dead. <laughs> I killed her. Yeah. <laughs> it's our highest rated episode to date. If you haven't listened to that yet. Well, it's it's little... also makes me nervous because it's our first episode. People probably <laughs> give us a shot and they're like, fuck this. <laughs> These guys suck. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. They never make it to poor Art Bell. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy was in his late 20s and the cause of death, again, was decapitation. This guy's a one-trick pony. Come on, mix it up. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Strangle a guy and then decapitate him. <laughs> That's that's gotta take a lot of, um, especially doing it to a guy. That has to take a lot of strength. Yeah, and unless you're knocking them out unconscious first and then doing it, and they all seem to be like clean, precise cuts. Which well, it, it seems like a skilled person is doing yeah. this. But you have to incapacitate somebody. Like I can't just come up behind you and just start cutting, clean your slice yeah. your head right off. I guess maybe you could. I, mean, I guess it depends what you're using. If it's sharp enough, I guess. Yeah. I just. I, yeah. I mean, hmm. if you weren't knocking them unconscious first, it would have to be a lot of strength to to wrestle somebody down and just like a one handed sleeper and then. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. We can practice on a dummy or something. <laughs> and that's what, and then going into this, the uh, the coroner noted that the lack of hesitation marks when dismembering the body indicated a strong, confident killer that was very familiar with the human anatomy. So it goes in. So well, yeah, the head had been like, cut off with one bold, clean stroke. Yeah. Like a doctor Ooh. or something like that, that would know the body or been able to do this. I would think so, right? That reminds me of Game of Thrones too. Just taking a big sword and just whacking someone's head off in one one clean, bold stroke. Yep. Mm-hmm. So Conan the Barbarian. There you go. That's how they kill his. I think it's his mom, mom or his dad. When he's a little kid, they come in an attack and he's holding his mom's hand and they ride by on a horse and cut her head off and he's sitting there holding the hand still as his mom's head falls to the ground <laughs> and then his mom's body falls and he's just looking at his hand. Now that up, that sounds familiar. I yeah. think I remember that. I scene. watched this as a kid. This was terrible for me. I mean, I loved. It. It, but it was it's oh my gosh like that scene sticks with me clearly yeah well i had to save us you guys were going on a game of thrones route i couldn't let that happen so that guy was never identified either huh yeah yeah so at this point there had been six killings in one year and the police had no clues or suspects the cleveland press the cleveland news and the cleveland plain dealer all reported almost daily on the on the killings and the lack of the lack of a suspect giving into mounting pressure from mayor harold burton elliot ness gets more involved in the case uh coroner pierce calls for what the newspapers dub a torso clinic yeah <laughs> sounds fun a meeting of the police, the coroner, and other es- experts to discuss information and to profile someone who could be responsible for the killings. Which, I don't think there was a lot of profiling done way back then, so... No, it's unusual. unusual. They need to get the uh, super cop from Richard Chase to do the profile. Yeah. That we talked about last episode, too. Mm. What, Ray Biondi? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Super cop. Yeah. Yeah, that dude was all over it. He... Master profiler. Mm-hmm. He wrote the book literally for the FBI, didn't he? Of how they allow profile people. They, yeah, they still like use he, his, his profile for yeah. the disorganized serial killer. If only he was around back then. Mm-hmm. The police department put detectives Peter Murillo and Martin Zawiski on the case full time 
So they went through the uh, like the underbelly of of the city, like undercover, right? So they were yeah. dressed up as transients and tried to just mill around with the people in there, right? So by the end of the case, these two guys had interviewed more than fifteen hundred people. The department as a whole, more than five thousand people, and this would be the biggest police invest- investigation in Cleveland history. Wow, it's a lot of people. Yeah, it is. the the uh, The November elections return Harold Burton as mayor. But Coroner Pierce is replaced by a young Democrat and now legendary Sam Gerber. Gerber's fierce dedication to medicine, along with his degree in law, put him at the forefront of the investigation. Well, he's coming in ready to go. Right. Young, bright-eyed, ready to change the world. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Saying he's ready to go. This is the guy that gets famous later with the whole Sam Shepard case, I believe. That's why they frame him like legendary like that. Another hometown hero. In a future yeah. episode, I'm sure, at some point. <laughs> yeah, we got a, got a bunch of them. February 1937, a man finds the upper half of a woman's torso washed up on the shore east of downtown. Unlike the previous victims, the cause of death had not been decapitation. This had happened after she was already dead. All right, so he's mixing it up a little bit. A little bit, yeah. The lower half of her torso washed ashore three months later, a couple miles away from from the previous parts of her body. The woman was in her mid-20s, and like a bunch of the other ones, she was never identified. Hmm. June 1937, a teenage boy discovered a human skull under a bridge that led into the city. Next to it was a burlap bag containing the skeletal remains of what what turned out to be a petite black woman that was 40 years old. Dental work allowed for the unofficial identification of Rose Wallace. Police followed every lead they had on her, but it, all the leads led nowhere. So I think there's a death mask of her at the museum, too. I believe so. so they they think that's awesome. who it was, but they couldn't positively say, I guess. Yeah. So in this one, it says only a month later, July 1937, there were labor problems at the flats that summer, and the National Guard had been called in to maintain order. There was a guardsman standing standing watch by a bridge and saw the first piece of, of victim number nine wash past or uh, float past a tugboat. (laughs) (laughs) Over the next few days, police recovered the entire body except for the head from the Cuyahoga River. The abdomen had been gutted and the heart ripped out clearly indicating a new element of viciousness in, in how the killer was, was going about things. This victim was in his uh, mid to late 30s, and he was never identified. Clearly, Man. you know, when I said earlier that we had a polluted river that caught fire, <laughs> I was not joking when I said polluted. You got bodies floating <laughs> right. in there all the time, mixed with all of our freaking trash and garbage. I mean, you're just sitting there, and then behind the tugboat... <laughs> arm or legs <laughs> floating by in the wake whatever it was yeah that's ridiculous <laughs> the body counts uh, picking up here yeah yeah it's it is it does seem like it's getting more rapid here april 1938 a young laborer on his way on his way to work in the flats saw what he first thought was a dead fish alongside the banks of the Cuyahoga River. But when he got closer, it revealed to be the lower half of a woman's leg, and that was the first piece of victim number 10. A month later, police pulled two burlap bags out of the river, containing both parts of the torso and most of the rest of both legs. Hmm. For the first time, Coroner Gerber detected drugs in the system. Interesting. Yeah. So, the, and the question would be, like, were the drugs used to immobilize the victim, or was she was she already a drug addict didn't seem like using drugs to mobilize his victims though were the killers Mm-mm. mo it just seems like maybe she had just been a drug user maybe and yeah, they don't say what kind of drugs yeah, and she was never identified either you don't say <laughs> i sense a pattern august 16th 1938 three scraps three scrap collectors foraging in a dump site downtown found the torso of a woman wrapped in a man's double-breasted blue blazer and then wrapped again in an old quilt. The legs and arms were discovered in a recently constructed makeshift box wrapped in brown butcher paper and held together with rubber bands. The head had also been wrapped in the same way. Gerber noted that um, some of the parts looked as if they had been refrigerated. Well, so there's a storage place, Dave. Yeah. It took a lot of care in wrapping up those pieces, parts, and rubber banding them, and butcher yeah. paper. and Which is weird, because in other people, he would just kill and decapitate, and they'll just leave there. Yeah. Like, it's just... He was evolving as an artist. So. Getting more uh, more violent, too. Yeah. While the police were searching for, 
for more pieces of the victim, they discovered the remains of a second body that was only yards away. These two bodies had been placed in a location that was in plain view of Elliot Ness's office window, basically taunting him. And both these victims, 11 and 12, were never identified. That's a bold uh, move. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Right for outside sure. Elliot's window. August 18th, 1938, at 1240 a.m., Elliot Ness and a group of 35 police officers and detectives raid the hobo jungles of the Kingsbury Run. 11 squad cars, two police vans, and three fire trucks descended on the largest cluster of makeshift shacks where the Cuyahoga River um, runs behind the public square. Public square, which is like the heart of downtown Cleveland. Right. Yeah. So they worked their way south through the run, eventually gathering up 63 men. At dawn, police and firemen searched the deserted shanties for clues. Then on orders of of Elliot Ness, the shacks were set on fire and burned to the ground. Wow. So, yeah, he wasn't fucking so around with that. trying to send a message there? That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah, or just clear all the people out of there, get rid of the hunting grounds, perhaps? Let's, Drive the guy out of town? It's a bold way to go about doing it. You know, start setting shit on fire. Yeah, and, putting everyone's life at risk. Hey. You don't need no water. Let the motherfucker burn. <laughs> Burn, motherfucker. Burn. <laughs> Elliot Ness, also a fantastic beer by yeah. Great Lakes Brewery. Mm-hmm. That is tasty. Those of you that have the option of ever trying Great Lakes Brewery, it's uh, probably the most popular, well-known brewery out of Cleveland. And Elliot Ness is a fantastic uh, beer. That's a good one. It's Mike approved, Ian approved, Dave it's a, approved. It's all right. I prefer the it's Kolsch. N- it's Necronompot approved. <laughs> Dortmunder is the flagship. If you're ever correct, uh, if you ever have the chance to have Dortmunder, that's their flagship beer. It's not the best. I mean, well, I like it. It's not yeah, their right. best, but it's it's very good. It's it's consistent. What's that new IPA? That's my favorite. Oh boy, they uh, I can't remember the name of it. That's, All their IPAs are so good. Uh, this one I drink. I'm gonna kick myself if I don't remember. Keep talking. Well, I drank two tall drafts of those at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, and I was right. <laughs> it started Woo! off my day roll. Really well, there's good. Commodore Perry. No, not that one. But, um... Yeah, because that was the day I was... T- oh, that's the day that I posted on Facebook on the, the public, the, um... The, the chill si- wave. Yeah, chill wave, yeah. Chill. The, and that was also the Lake Erie Monster IPA, which yeah. is fantastic. That chill wave is... Delicious. It's very strong. But like you have two of those, dude. It's I do feel on it. IPA? Yeah. I never had yeah. That. I know you don't like you don't love IPAs though. But it's for experienced beer drinkers like us, a couple of those, and <laughs> you're you're feeling rocked. Yeah. That's when I posted on the Medina the um the local Facebook page about people were fighting about something and I just made a comment and then I started getting blown up. <laughs> you were feeling all like chill waved up, mm-hmm. bold and, and, and encouraged. I and never post on social media and the one time I did and I was super drunk and then people were just blowing me <laughs> and up. It was also probably 2.13 in the afternoon. It was. <laughs> it was like, yeah, it was like 2.30, 3 o'clock. Life's too short to not argue with people on the internet. Man. Oh man, I don't like getting into that. I'm a big fan of day drinking. I'm not a big fan of no. online wars and battles. I didn't even say anything unreasonable either. Everything. I just made a simple comment. It wasn't like uh, I wasn't out there mm. saying anything too crazy. Yeah, but you're, you're arguing with pissed off suburban parents. <laughs> right. That's one group you don't mess with. <laughs> it goes like Bloods, Crips, and suburban parents. <laughs> Maybe not in that order. Crips don't get pissed at me. You and Bloods are both up there. But anyways, yeah. Elliot Nass, good beer. So this goes into the next year, July 1939. County Sheriff Martin O'Donnell arrested 52-year-old Bohemian bricklayer Frank Dozal for the murder of Flo Palillo. Dozal had lived with her for a while, and the subsequent investigation revealed that he had been acquainted with Edward Andersey and Rose Wallace. So this was a year after the last body was found. So and this guy has connections, him, yeah, too. Yeah, and he was connected to three of the victims. Hmm. So it took a while. I mean, it's zero activity for almost a year. Right. Yeah. One that all stopped because they burned that whole little yeah. village to the ground. I think like people said it's not going to work, but and then it, it stopped. stopped. I mean, yeah. there were no more victims after they burned it. I wonder how the last one they thought was refrigerated in an area like that. You know, unless the guy worked somewhere where he had access to a refrigerator or something. Yeah, because I don't think most people had refrigerators back then, did they? I think so. It's like an ice box, right? Yeah. Yeah, I guess. But maybe not the capacity to store bodies. Yeah. Probably. Right. Yeah. Well, that's why you cut them up. No. Even then, I feel like a nice box would just be small, right? Or, or no. I'm not sure what a 1930s ice box would look like. Yeah. Just like a cooler, right? I mean, 
I guess so. Yeah. yeah. Well, when, when did you know retail, you know, modern day refrigerators hit it. the market? I, get, I feel kind of dumb that I don't know this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. A household appliance for preserving food at a low temperature, eighteen fifty six. We are fucking dumbasses. We weren't even close. We were nearly a hundred years off. Eight, that's not right. 1856? For an icebox or an actual plug-in? There was no plug-ins yeah. in 1856. What, who did I say invented electricity last time when we were off the air? <laughs> Benjamin Franklin? <laughs> we did something like this in one of the earlier shows, too, where we were, like, fucking 80 years off. So, <laughs> refrigerate, like, so a first cooling systems for food involved ice. Artificial refrigeration began in the mid-1750s. And developed in the early 1800s. In 1834, the first working vapor compression refrigerator system was built. The first commercial ice making machine was invented in 1854. In 1913, refrigerators for home use were invented. 1913. Okay. All right. I don't know how widespread, but... The introduction of Freon in the 1920s expanded Mm. the refrigerator market during the 1930s. So... There were refrigerators. Okay. But I mean, depression era, it's not like your everyday average yeah. joke. probably going to be a luxury probably. item. Yeah. I, I think that's probably right. Um, so this guy's confession was just a, a blend of incoherent ramblings. But he also had precise details in there, almost as if he had been coached. Before he could go to trial, Dolezal found, was found dead in his cell. The five foot eight Dolezal hanged himself from a hook only five feet seven inches from the floor. So that's, that's oh presents a logistic problem. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> what did you pick your legs up? Or you just kind of raise up and slam down, break know. your neck from an inch, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. But his autopsy revealed that he had six broken ribs, all of which had been obtained while in the sheriff's custody. To this day, no one thinks that Frank Dolezal was the torso killer. Interesting. But it, I, when I was looking at some of this stuff, man, because I, I don't know if we said this, but this is this is a Dave special tonight. This is uh this is Dave's research on this one. I when I was looking into this one a little bit, I saw that this guy was going to recant, or he was in the process of recanting his right, story, yeah. and then all of a sudden, oh, he's dead. Yeah. So they're thinking the um, hanging was just a a hoax or a cover-up for maybe them just killing him. Yeah. Strangely enough, the suicides have continued to this day in the Cuyahoga County Jail. Oh, boy. Well, hometown guy, uh, Ariel Castro. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was just someone last week. Someone last week. Oh, really? I didn't even know about that. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like Ariel Castro was uh, just a turn a blind eye on that one. Just let him do that. Yeah, there might be something to that. We'll have to study that one. That one's inter- interesting. Hometown hero number four or five. Yeah. <laughs> piece of shit, that guy. No, major I mean, yes, they piece all of are, shit. But this one we kind of lived through recently. Yeah. So uh, most investigators consider the last murder to have been in 1938. And they had one suspect, which um, Elliot Ness kept unnamed. And then you said he, what did you call him? Gaylord Sundime? That was I believe it was the <laughs> alias. He wouldn't release it, the the guy's name. Years later, it came out that this guy's name was he was uh, Doctor Francis E. Sweeney. Sweeney was a veteran of World War One who was part of a medical unit that conducted amputations in the field. So, so he fits the bill, right? I guess the guy was a paranoid schizophrenic, which is how he came to the attention. I guess. Yeah, that, they, the I bet you that's probably they probably saw that, and then his credentials with with you know with medical yeah. stuff. And, and I like, think he had an office in the area of, of some of the killings. I think that added to it. But again, it wasn't found out. That this guy was the the suspect until you know thirty years later, I think. Really? So again, more questions than there are actual answers. <laughs> yeah, right. with this well, one. and another thing is that the official police file from this case disappeared. It's gone. So a lot of the stuff later on was reconstructed from notes and, and whatnot. But yeah, yeah, the file's gone. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, Sweeney was later personally interviewed by. Elliot Ness, who oversaw the uh, the investigations into the killings. During this interrogation, Sweeney is said to have failed a, uh, a really two really early polygraph tests, which I, those can't be reliable at all. Right. Yeah, they're not even admissible in court today. Like right. Back in the 30s, when according to Dave's research, refrigerators weren't even invented. <laughs> We were only off by about 100 oh, years. Oh, boy. 
No, know? that's not true. It was about a decade of prior is when they started. What do we say? In home commercial sale uh, of them. So that was an unfair jab by me. Mm-hmm. Well, aren't you supposed to put a tack in your shoe or something and step on it to, to spike the polygraphs? Isn't that a way to beat them? Uh, I don't you know. You ever hear that? No. Mm-hmm. So like the pain covers? Yeah. Really? That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I've, I've read that. That makes sense. Hmm. You guys want to try it? I think that's the other yeah. way to beat hypnosis, too. <laughs> yeah. Just put a tack on in tack your shoe. It yeah. prevents you from being hypnotized. <laughs> or just be pragmatic about it and realize that no one's going to control your fucking mind. It's not mind. No one ever <laughs> said mind control. That's exactly what it is. No. Oh, man. Uh, both of these tests were administered by um, a polygraph expert named Leonard Keeler, who told Ness that this was after after uh, after Sweeney failed the test. He said this was the guy. But um, Elliot Ness apparently felt that there was there was little chance of obtaining a successful prosecution of the doctor. And and then on top of it, this guy was first cousins of one of Ness's political opponents, Congressman Martin Lee or sorry, Congressman Martin L. Sweeney, who had hounded Ness publicly about his failure to catch the killer. So if if Elliot Ness is already thinking that they don't have a whole lot on this guy by him going after him, it's just going to be perceived as him going after one of his political adversaries, yeah. close family right. members. Loose, loose. Yeah. But again, we don't know what he had on this guy. We don't know what he had on Sweeney. Yeah. Other than we know he was gone. a skilled right. surgeon and he might have had an office in the area. Maybe there wasn't much more to it. Right. That could very well be. Yeah. Sweeney ended up committing himself to a mental hospital and there were no, no more leads or connections that the police could assign to him as a possible suspect. From the hospital, threatening postcards with Sweeney's name mocked and harassed Ness and his family into the 1950s. So he trolled them for like 15 years. Yeah. Or was it someone else sending them in his name? Maybe. Sweeney mocked Ness. Yeah, he was sending postcards. Yeah. But how much of that could have just been his his, his mental health, too? Yeah. And then Sweeney died in, um, in a veteran's hospital in Dayton in 1964. So that I mean that pretty much uh pretty much sums up the story. And since you're then since this is your uh since you're the expert on this one, Dave, I'll leave it up to you for the theories on this one. So there's several. I mean, so six months after the last murder, uh, the, the Cleveland chief of police got an anonymous letter from Los Angeles indicating that, you know, he left Cleveland and headed west and he gave him a location for where he had buried the head of his latest victim in L.A. And they, they, they checked and they never found it. But And then eight years later, the Black Dahlia murder happened out in L.A. Right. A lot of people think this is the same person based on the similarities. Interesting. And there's another... But they didn't find the head, though. No. That's I mean, it could have been anyone just writing an anonymous letter. But they knew that the murders had stopped in Cleveland, and they didn't continue. That's true. Yeah. And there's another series of murders in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, that started before this and stopped, you know, from 35 to 38 and picked up again in 39 right after this. Really? And one it's was the, the black, swamp murders. When was the Black Dahlia one? 47. So there was plenty of time to do all that. Yeah. So he was killing people in Newcastle murders. before, came to Cleveland. Right. Then the killing started again in Newcastle in 1939, and then the Black Dahlia, 47. They could all be tied together. Some people think they are. Yeah. That's well, kind of like how H.H. H. Holmes and... Um, uh, Jack the Ripper, they kind of think it's the same. It's the same guy because the timeline kind of fits. And because he was in London, right? Right. Yeah. I'm excited to cover H. H. Holmes. Yeah, that'd be an interesting one. Yeah, in the future, that would be crazy if this was all the same person responsible oh, yeah. for all that. I mean, but how many people are out there with the same, you know, the same killing mo, the same surgical yeah. you know, knowledge and technique? I mean, right. We be... should ask Ed Kemper. Does he have numbers <laughs> on how many different uh, serial killers there were out there at one time? Wasn't that him that they asked when um, he was in prison? Like they asked. How how many how many serial killers do you think are out there? And he like said eighty or ninety. Or yeah, something. he gave a number, or he well, he initially said I'm not the only one yeah. was what he said. Okay, and something along those lines. Yeah. What is the number? Do you guys either? You guys know that what the FBI thinks is operating at any given time? Three hundred ish, maybe. It's twenty five to thirty or twenty five to fifty. Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't know where I got three. You were way <laughs> off. Jeez. That's still a lot. It's, I, that is a lot. Yeah, it said that uh, if it's 50, they're responsible for uh, each one would be responsible for three murders a year in the U.S. Which seems a little low. I think not. I think technology now has eliminated a lot of serial killing. That's true. You have to be, because it's harder really to get away with. Yeah, cover yeah. your tracks mm-hmm. really well. Yeah. Plan things out a lot more. Right. But can't be doing this Richard Ramirez shit, leaving footprints and bright colored car. Wasn't that him? Yeah, the orange twin. And then they came out and they announced <laughs> like his shoes in his car. Right. And so he just changed them. <laughs> Threw them off the bridge. Yeah. I mean, so there's other theories that it's um, 
a series of killers, you know, not the same person based on the inconclusive autopsy results. The guy, the 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 local expert that wrote the book on this believes that Sweeney was the killer. I watched an interview with him. He said 99.9% sure that Sweeney was the guy. Really? Yeah. yeah. Dr. James Badal. What about the, um, never anything about that red chemical or that chemical that made their skin turn red? No, I never saw any, anything else on that. Hmm. I'm curious That's about what's, that. That's what sucks of the story is there's just so many un, uh, questions yeah. left unanswered. It's just wild. Like, even the photos that there are, you know, from like the crime scenes and, and these bodies are just Brutal. sickening. Yeah, yeah that's about as the, far as it goes. The museum's cool. I want to get down there. Yeah, there's some cool stuff go. down there. Yeah, Cleveland legend, mm. the Mad Butcher, yeah. hometown heroes. <laughs> <laughs> um all right ian you got anything else on uh on this guy nope or Just, girl we don't know this killer yeah. you think it was a female killer i don't know i mean you, you can't say i guess maybe so you got anything on the tour somewhere nope nope thanks to uh thanks to dave for doing this outline for this one yeah give yeah me, give me a break this week give you a little <laughs> night off wow spoiled <laughs> dave you got anything uh no inconclusive results here on this one but i think it's likely it was sweeney based on i would just like to know what more evidence there was i mean it, it, he fits the bill failed the polygraph test i guess that's zero for two yeah. had a mental illness zero for three you read the book and so what was the name of that book it's, it's called in the wake of the butcher all right that's Doctor. the recommended read for uh yeah. more on this story awesome he's a local expert all right so ian we got any uh shout outs um, I just have two for iTunes, um, Matt030 and Dan Mathewson. Thanks, guys, for the awesome reviews. And then I know I said it's like three weeks now I've said it, but we've gotten about like 15 to 20 five-star ratings on iTunes Fucking a week. awesome. So thanks, everybody. It's awesome to uh, to get the feedback, and it's really cool. Yeah, I know Nerd Mike's been running around taking credit for all of it. He thinks that his <laughs> his stock went up tenfold, and... People are clamoring for meet and greets with him and shirts. And yeah, he's he's already uh, put himself as bigger than Necronomapod. So. Oh, thanks, guys. I really appreciate the five star ratings. <laughs> See, so it's it's out of hand. Um, whatever. It's working, yeah. I guess. He's getting us ratings. It's all that counts, um, right? He's better than country, Mike, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, and then thanks for all the Instagram stuff on the on the bonus episode. Yeah, from people this past week. Yeah. Uh, people were hyped about uh, Robert Berdella. Yeah, that would, show's doing real well. I was interested to see how it would uh, how it play out. Not doing one for a couple weeks since we had to take a break on right. him, and then giving a pretty pretty thick, uh, juicy uh, bonus episode. Yeah. that wasn't so. like a quick half hour one by any means. Uh, cool. B -b -b Bravo, <laughs> <laughs> Dave. You got any uh, shout outs? Uh, shout out to flower.may on Instagram. Thanks for your support. All right. Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, YouTube, at Necronomapod. Like Ian said, if you're on iTunes, uh, a rating and review is awesome. Goes a long way to help us. And then other than that, just hit us up on any of the socials and uh, let us know your thoughts. We love interacting with you guys. We like hearing what you guys think about the episodes and uh, just uh, overall talking with you guys. So keep it up and thanks a lot. You guys ready for a cool down beer? Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>